Shabbat Shalom, everybody. We're gathered today on the 23rd of the fifth month on our Creator's calendar, which happens to line up with the 5th of August, 2023, on the Gregorian calendar. And we are continuing with our reading of the uh, common scriptures or Bereshit, Genesis, right now. We are currently on chapter 11. And I mentioned to our group last week that there's kind of some issues with this. And so we're going to take a moment, this video at least, to just talk about that and go over the different things that we know for everyone's edification and further study at their own you know, choosing. But um, <clears throat> first, we'll go ahead and read the chapter, and then we'll go over the, the problems with what's in the Masoretic text, specifically in regard to the ages of the patriarchs when they had their children, and what all that's about. And then we're also going to cover a little bit of what this publication or this writing has to do with, okay? So just one moment. This is Bereshit, or Genesis chapter 11. And it's not fully edited yet, so please forgive me. I would have to carry over his name still. And this is a work in progress. We're trying to get an accurate version of scripture. And this is why I was kind of leery about sharing it. I don't want to just leave text in here that isn't accurate if we know something that is. But we'll get to that. So it says, And all the earth had one language and one speech, which the book of Yobelim calls the language of creation or the Hebrew language, which is never actually called Hebrew that I'm aware of in any part of what we call the Bible. There's only two places that I'm familiar with that mention what's called the language of the Jews in the modern English. But when you look at the Hebrew, what that says is Yahudith. The Yahudith, so it's the language of those who confess, acknowledge, and praise Yahuwah. <clears throat> That also happens to be the name of Yahudith, or what they known as Judith, who was a matriarch that was a heroine in the original covenant times and has an apocryphal book written about her. But the idea that the language would be lost and how it is is mentioned in Yobelim and elsewhere, and that the fact that it will be restored again is, is also there. One thing I'd like to point out, and we'll cover more in time, is that the language is still in creation. It was given back to Abraham. We see that in Yobelim chapter 12. But within his children even, as we sinned and turned from the truth, accepted idolatry, and did things contrary to what was right towards one another, the language has changed. Sometimes it changed by those not doing anything overtly offensive, as we have an example in the ancient history of Caledonia, where it mentions from the Hebrews that left Egypt to found Troy, and then they went from Troy, which is in Turkey, modern-day uh, Turkey, ancient Anatolia, or Asia Minor. And they went from there to Crete, from Crete to Sicily, and from Sicily to Gaul, or what we call France. And each time they left paganized Hebrews, and just a remnant would travel along. So you had them mixing with the sons of Japheth, from antiquity, as early as a thousand years before the, or over a thousand years before our Mashiach came. And um, you can see that influence by the time they got to the land of Montrose or Scotland, as we call it, the highlands of uh, Scotland there, the language was shifting and it became what we call Gaelic or Celtic. And that was actually evidenced in the book itself, where they had not done anything wrong. Another evidence of that is in the book of Tetaphi, where she says that it was be taken from them. Gad the seer and Zeph and Yahu both mention that it's restoration and recovery. But for right now, it's not that way. And we can see how the language has changed and the divergent things that have happened to it in all the different versions of German or Germanic languages and Celtic languages today. The uh, ancient influence of the, the Hebrew on Greek is also known and written about over 100 years ago, and the effects of that uh, language, the Hebrew, the Hebrew Gaelic of, of the Scotland, right, mixed with Greek that was influencing the Latin, the ancient Latin of antiquity. 
And these are books, again, written by people in the 1800s when they were studying this stuff. But all of that confirms the history and the ancient history of Caldonia and the facts that are in Scripture about what was going to happen. Then you can follow along modern history with the migrations of the, the Germanic hordes, the shifting of the languages as they traveled, the, the shifting of the language just in England itself with the different comings of the different waves of the tribes of Hebrews that invaded, the violence they did to one another, and the change that happened to the language from low German to what we call English today is all based on this. It's, but it will be restored again, right? This isn't moving on. Sorry about that. My puppy's crying in the background. It says, and it came to be as they set out from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there and they said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. Or this is the bitumen, what they call pitch or tar, right? And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the Shemaim and make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered over all the face of the earth. Now, that statement is directly contradictory to the, the instructions given by the Almighty. Yahuwah had told them, be fruitful and multiply, spread, spread throughout the face of the earth and fill it, Right? And so the things that they were doing here were at the instigation of an, another influence. Then Yahuwah came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And Yahuwah said, look, they are one people and they all have one language. And this is what they began to do. And now they are not going to be withheld from doing whatever they plan to do. Come, let us go down, or let us go there and confuse their language so that they do not comprehend one another's speech. Now, this has been used to imply that there's multiple powers that were involved in creation, and there's a host of mighty ones that were all doing things, and a whole bunch of weird doctrine. But it's, it's explained that this was the father speaking to his son through whom he is mediated. And that his son went to investigate because he doesn't, he tries to set the example that we are to follow in all things. And he's patient and kind. While he foreknew what was going on, the example is to investigate a matter and not to assume. And so he does this to teach a man. If he foreknows these things and there's nothing hidden, but he still questions and investigates and does things even with Cain and Abel until he realized the man was a liar and then call them on it. The, the, this is what we are to learn from, right? But Irene, Irenaeus, and I believe it's in the Apostolic Constitutions, explain that this is the father speaking to his son through whom he was pleased to do all these things, right? And Yahuwah scattered them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city, that is why its name was called Babel, because there Yahuwah confused the language of all the earth, and from there scattered, or Yahuwah scattered them over the face of all the earth. And this is where we get into the parts that are in error, okay? We're going to go ahead and read through it, and then we'll cover the, the, the section. But generally, and this is what you'll find when you look at that brother's videos that he shared. It's called uh, "Why were the Israel or How long were the Israelites in Egypt, and when were the pyramid or were the pyramids built before the flood?" He goes into detail about the different versions or translations of Scripture, and the what they tend to say that prove one genealogy over another in a very concise manner. So, I want to recommend those, and I'll share them in the description of the video too, for anyone that wants to watch. But uh, we'll cover a little bit different topic here in just a moment. So it says, this is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old and brought forth a parkshad. Shem means name, fame, character, renown, 
what you are known for and where you are at. Okay. It, it's also literally translated as there. Okay. So Shem was 100 years old and brought forth a park shad two years after the flood. A park shad means a congregation assembled. Okay. And after he brought forth a park shad, Shem lived 500 years and brought forth sons and daughters. And a park shad lived 35 years. All of these dates generally are 100 years shorter than they should be. And that's what we'll see here in a bit. It says, and he brought forth Selach, which means sent one. Like the, the Shiliachim are the emissaries or the apostles, as we call them. The Hebrew word is the Shiliachim. So Shiliach with a Yod or with a Yod Mem is a plural masculine suffix. And that means the sent ones. But he's literally the sent one, right? It's um, where you get, when you shellac a table, you're sending the suds across it. It's a, the generally from that same root. This is an after he brought forth Selah, a park shad, lived 403 years and brought forth sons and daughters. And Selah lived 30 years and brought forth Eber, which means to cross over, right? And after he brought forth Eber, Selah lived 403 years and brought forth sons and daughters. Now, Eber married the daughter of Nimrod, who was the king of Babel at the, when, that built Babylon, the Tower of Babel. Okay, Just to keep in mind the differences here. And again, the reason why they shorten the, the beginning years of the lifespans is so they can have Shem be alive, presumably at the same time Abraham is. So that, or even up to the time of Yaakov, and they do that so that they can claim that Shem is Melchizedek that Abraham appeared to. When the scriptures clearly say in the Psalms and in the Hebrews that Melchizedek is a was our Mashiach, right? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have a scroll that's called the coming of Melchizedek. And in that, it unequivocally shows that the one who came that read the, the scroll from Yeshayahu about the year of Yahuwah's favor and declared that this is done and this is now filled in your hearing, he was and is Melchizedek. Yahuwah Melchizedek to one, the one in whom was bringing the favor. As mentioned, it's the year of Yahuwah's favor. It's quoted in that scroll as the year of Melchizedek's favor because he is Yahuwah, Yahushua. He is the Mashiach. He is Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, if you will, who inherited the name above every name, everything as it's written, the simple truth, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. But they try to hide that. And it, you'll see here that even if you look at how long they live, there's too much of a difference between here which is the 14th generation. Eber was the son, right? Or Selah was the same as a contemporary with Nimrod, who was 13th generation, the third generation after the flood. Abraham was the 20th. So you have hundreds of years between them here. But it says, and after he brought forth Eber, Selah lived 403 years and brought forth sons and daughters. And Eber lived 34 years and brought forth Peleg, which means divided. And after he brought forth Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and brought forth sons and daughters. And Peleg lived 30 years. He was named that because in his days the land was divided. So when he was born, Eber named him Peleg because that's when the Tower of Babel incident happened. And they had done the allotments of dividing up the land. Right? And he brought forth Reu, meaning his evil. Okay? Ra'u is his evil. And after he brought forth Ra'u, Peleg lived 209 years and brought forth sons and daughters. And Reu lived 32 years and brought forth Sheruch. 
and his name is actually changed to something else. I I can't remember what his name means, but it is rather interesting. It says, and after he brought forth Serug, Reu lived 207 years and brought forth sons and daughters. And Serug lived 30 years and brought forth Nehor. And after he brought forth Nehor, Serug lived 200 years and brought forth sons and daughters. And Nehor lived 29 years and brought forth Terach. And we hear, we learn in Yobelim that Terach was named as such because when he was born was when the ravens were eating the seed that was being sown in the field. And there was famine and desolation in the land uh, of the Mediterranean or the Mesopotamia at the time, or the, the inheritance of Shem, if you will. It says, and after he brought forth Terach, who is the father of Abram, and he was also the priest of the city of Uts or Ur of the Kazdim, right? It says, Nahor lived 119 years and brought forth sons and daughters. And Terach lived 70 years and brought forth Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And this is the genealogy of Terach. Terach brought forth Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran brought forth Lot. And Haran died before his father Terach in the land of his birth in Ur, Kazdim. Now, they normally translate this as Chaldean, right? Like the Chaldeans. But that is, that's not actually the name. It's Kazdim is the pronunciation. And if you remember, I mentioned the ancient history of Caldonia. Those people, the Caldonians, were known as the Chaldeans or the Ka, the, Ka, the Koldi. That was their name. And they were some of the most righteous people in the history of the Hebrews that lived on the earth for a time. They were such a thorn in the side of Rome and an adversary to the forces of Satan for their obedience to our maker that they kept overcoming them. And you can read about it in their history. But the, the Romans, the, they absolutely hated them. And so they named the worst enemies, the very, the witch, the very idolatrous witch, um, those practicing witchcraft in Babylon after the Chaldeans <laughs> instead of what they were actually named, which is Kazdim, or to be like Ka Sadim, demons, which is what they were because they were involved in astrology. The founder of the city had found the writings of the watchers, recorded them, and then didn't tell Noah about it and passed it down to his children, which is why you had the astrology from Babylon at such an early time. That's also found in the book of Yobelim. So it says, And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father, the father of Milcah, the father of Yishkah. And Sarai was barren, she had no child. And Terach took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife. And they went out with them from ur Kazdim to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terach came to be 205 years, and Terach died in Haran. Now, real quick, before we move off this topic here, Abram's wife was also his half-sister. This is explained by uh, Josephus when he's going over these events, and it's also mentioned in Yobelim. It's why he wasn't necessarily lying when he said, tell them that you're my sister so that you know, they won't kill me. But it was uh, a live omission. It was deceptive, but it was he was felt compelled to do so. So, um, also right here, where was it? Terok leaving, and the reason why Haran died is ex also explained in what's called the Book of Jubilees or Yobelim. And Abram, from an early age, realized that idolatry was unprofitable, and he tried to talk his father, who was the priest of these people, 
to not worship the idols for them. And he was told that, he, you know, I know my son, but if I do, if I don't do this, they're going to get angry and they'll rise up again. She just be quiet. He tried to talk to his brothers about it and they got angry with him. So he was quiet. By the time he was around 65 years old, he decided to go and burn down the house of the idols, quite like what you see an echo of with Gideon and others who destroyed the pagan stuff before reestablishing the truth. Abram did it in his life first. He burned down the house of idols in Haran. His brother died trying to save them. That's why he took on Lot and adopted him as his son. Just for some context in the history there. All right, now back on topic here. The the genealogy that we just read, the dates that the patriarchs were alive are not accurate in the Masoretic text. They're not entirely accurate in any of the texts that we have available per se throughout the entire thing. But when you compare them, when you look at the different versions and you see which ones say what, you can find where some have more witnesses and some have none. And that's what you can generally use to, to establish or determine what, which one is more accurate. I have not personally done that yet. Um, I am familiar with the concept, and this writing purports to be talking about that very thing, which I happened to find and I thought to share. So this is called the Septuagintal versus Masoretic Chronology in Genesis 5 and 11 by J.A. Young from Missionary Gospel Recordings. Okay. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want to go over the abstract here and the fact that it covers what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, what's in Genesis for the, the regular text of the Bible, okay, in the Masoretic text, in what's called the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Septuagint. And I want to go over real quickly what those are. So the scriptures that we have available from the beginning we have the writings of Hanok, who was the first to be given hokma or wisdom. He passed them down to his children, who also added their own personal writings in uh, firsthand accounts of things that were happening to pass on to posterity on occasion. And we have in existence within the Dead Sea Scrolls copies of the book of Hanok, the writings of Lemek, the writings of Noach, and the writings of Abram and a few others like Moshe in their personal first-hand accounts, okay? So you have those carried down through history. The ones that they had at the time would have been the dead, what we call the Book of Enoch, right? With the coming of uh, Moshe and the children being led out of the land, they were given the Torah, which he would have written. At the time he was taken up to the mountain, on the 16th of the third month, the day after they were given the covenant, where he spent 40 days and 40 nights in the cloud with, with Yahuwah, Yahushua, Mashiach, or Yahuwah of esteem, as they called him then. Uh, he was given what's called the Book of Jubilees, or Yobelim, where it was dictated to him. And it says that right there in chapter 1. But from that point, you had the general writings of the Torah and what was added to them by the, by the people that lived, the foretellers that wrote in their times, kings and chronicles that were kept, all right? And then um, at Babylon, everything was destroyed. It was all burned with fire. The, when they came in, the truth was, was hidden. It was a type and shadow of what would come. When Ezra returned, he was given the Ruach, and other scribes were given the Ruach where he would dictate, and they would write down all of the text of the scrolls. And it was copies of that, the versions that were kept by Ezra after the return from Babylon, that we have from the Zayd, the library from the people that were in the, the kahuna in the land. That's the Dead Sea Scrolls. It purports to be the library of the sons of Zadok, who were the legitimate people that were supposed to be serving as the Kohen. They went off into the wilderness when there was a usurpation by Edom, okay, which is type and picture of what happened with us as well with history and in later on fashion, but that's for a different time. And these ones were hidden and kept until uh, 
they were buried in the earth and they weren't discovered until the 1940s when the Yahudim were brought back to the land as foretold in Revelation. That's when the scrolls were rebirthed in the earth and came to light, but they weren't released to the public until 1991. So that's where we have these, it's the, all the, all the scrolls or all the books of the Bible and a lot more, all the apocryphal books, except for uh, the book of Esther is included. And then um, you have even more stuff that we weren't familiar with. And that was the library of the, the, the sons of Louis. The Samaritan Pentateuch. No, hold on. The Septuagint's next in chronological order after the time from Ezra's return and the writings that were carried down that became the Dead Sea Scrolls in the time where the Greek Empire was reigning over the people, the leader of the Greek, the the one of the Greek kingdoms that was in Egypt, Ptolemy the Third, I believe it was, was building the library at Alexandria, and he wanted to collect writings from all over. He sent an embassy with uh, the head of the embassy was Aristides with a letter to petition the Kohen to to have people come over to write a copy in Greek for them, and you have a record of that in what's called the letter of Aristides. That is the Septuagint version. It was, uh, it records the significance of it is that it records the foretellings in the book of Daniel about the coming of the Roman empire and the beast kingdoms that had been there before it actually happened. So you had two languages, two witnesses of the, the, the truth of that before the events took place. <clears throat> and it was the Septuagint version that the, the renewed covenant believers were using predominantly to refute and to prove to the Yahudim that Yahushua was the Mashiach. So that was around the, uh, between the second and third century BC. Okay. After the Greek or the first and second century BC. After the Greek empire had already taken over at the fall of the Medes and Persians, right? Then the next version that you have is the Samaritan Pentateuch. After the time when the Septuagint was written, while it was still during the reign of the Greek kings, you had um, you had some of the kings rise up and do Antiochus Epiphanes, rose up and attacked people in the land. He wasn't the only one, and you can read about those events in detail in the books of the Maccabees. There's five books um, I have the PDF we shared in the Telegram too. Most people acknowledge there's four books, but there's actually a fifth, and it has the chronology in it kind of messed up, but it is very enlightening when you look at that one too and you put them all together. But point being, um, and these are abridgments of what we originally had as well, just so you know. But uh, during the time where the Greeks were persecuting believers, some of the sons of Louis actually fled to Egypt and they built a temple there and they were generals for Cleopatra later on the sons of Louis it's an interesting phenomenon but another one um, some children of the sons of Aaron that were I believe of the son of On Onyahu so if you know about the the writing Sirach or the the writings of Sirach ben this has been Jesus, but Ben Yahushua, right? Or what they call Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiasticus, sorry. That writing took place a little bit before this event. But you had these two brothers that were officiating together. And one of them, the, the Kohen, had married a daughter of the Samaritans, which was not permissible of an influential man. And when the people rose up and said, hey, you can't, you got to put her away or you can't be serving. He went to his father-in-law and said, hey, you know, I, I, I don't want to give up the dignity of my office here. I'm going to have to not marry her. He said, oh, no, no, wait, wait, wait. I'll build you a temple on Mount Gizarim and you can serve there and we'll, we'll do that. And he agreed to that. So the gentleman petitioned. And I believe it was when uh, Alexander the Great was coming in, he got the permission granted to build that other temple. So maybe it was before that time. I'm sorry, not afterwards. It had something to do with Alexander the Great, uh, his time coming in. 
but he was given permission to build that second temple on Mount Gizarim in Samaria, which is why you had the Samaritan woman saying, hey, well, we heard that you say that it's there, but we have this in Mount Gizarim. Which one's legitimate, right? That's the story, the background behind that. And you can find more all of this in detail in the Antiquities of the Yahudim by Flavius Josephus, they call him, or Yahusuf, who was uh, a son of Louis, actually of the lines of the Kohens and a descendant of the, of the Maccabees from not the ruling line, but from the brother Yahu Nathan. So that was when the Samaritan Pentateuch would have been made. And in this version, you won't find references to Yarushalayim, but Mount Gizarim added, However, it's another witness to different events, and they only have the first five books without the additions or the extra things because there was so much stuff talking about Yarushalayim and tying it back to that. But these are where you have the general texts, the different versions of these chronologies for the ages of the patriarchs. And that's what is being talked about here on um, why you can't trust the legitimacy of the Masoretic text. So real quick. We'll just cover this part, and I'll have this also in the description, along with the videos that I highly recommend you watch for context on this, because it will make it a lot more clear. I'm skipping all of that information because he covers it great, and I just want to cover this extra stuff. So I highly recommend going over that, and then when we continue next week, Ab willing, Father willing, it'll be uh, less confusing why we don't generally agree with the timelines that are just right there in the common scriptures that everybody has. So it says, as a result of analyzing the Dead Sea Scrolls, numerous scholars have concluded that before the first century standardization of the Hebrew Masoretic text, I'm sorry, I forgot to cover that. The last one covered is the Masoretic text. And again, this was concluded that before the first century standardization, right? After the fall of the Hekel in 70 AD, the people got together and the, the Yahudim that had rejected our Mashiach had a, a Sanhedrin or a council, if you will, to decide what they would consider scripture and what wasn't. And then they cursed anyone who would look at the stuff they said is not legitimate. And that is the basis of what became the Masoretic text. This was full, and some of it is also tampered with when you look at like Psalm 23, when it talks about how they pierced his hands and feet. If you look at the Masoretic version, it says a lion at my hands and feet because they used the vowel points and the words to change the meaning of it to hide who it's talking about. Um, there's other evidences of that, including the genealogies that we're reading about right now. But that wasn't full. The, what they call the Masoretic text was not fully written or established until about 1500 or the 15th century. So while it was beginnings in the first century, this version was not done until the 15th century. And it is the newest version of any of these writings historically. So back on back on track here. <clears throat> It said, um, before the standardization of the Hebrew Masoretic text and the imposition of external rabbinical controls, some scribes employed text correctional procedures, which are discoverable by comparing the extent textual witnesses, meaning they corrected themselves within the, the writings themselves, and you can find it by looking at the writings and comparing them, right? An analysis of three records indicates consensus harmonization of the chronological data rather than accidental error, perhaps in order to correct suspected errors or to conform to certain theological views. Patriarchal ages at the death of Genesis 5 seem to have been recorded using the ancient sexag sexagesmial numerical system. And it's this the ages of them as it's, it's, as it is explained in the scriptures there. You can read it, but that's just a word to describe what that is, okay? Testifying to their great antiquity and providing a diagnostic test for reported ages in other biographical categories. Applying text-critical criteria to the evidence of the ages in per 
paternity in the three traditions tends to the inference that the greater ages found in the Septuagint may be more independent, older, and possibly more original with a stronger claim to authenticity than the lower ages reported in the Masoretic text or the Samaritan Pentateuch. So all that to say that men have looked at these things, they've written about it, talked about it, and there's a consensus that maybe the Masoretic text has been messed with and it's not accurate. It, it's possibly more accurate with the older or the longer dates in the other versions which is exactly what's covered in the videos as well. This is another witness to the gentleman. And for the record, I can't remember his name. His first name is Nathan. But he's been, there's a lot of videos that discredit the two that he made. I think even, oh, that uh, that creation minister that, that does debates all the time. He went to jail for a while and came back. He still does stuff. He's absolutely adamant against any belief in the scriptural cosmology. But he does teach and he tries to show science and scripture go to hand to hand. I can't remember his name, but he made a video dedicated just to talking about how this gentleman was wrong because uh, because of uh, the chronology there. So there's a, there's a lot that discredit it. But here is a text from actual people talking about what the scholars believe, contrary to what's actually taught to people generally. Mm -hmm. So it says, our three major textual sources are the Masoretic Hebrew text, here referred to as M, the Greek translation called the Septuagint, or LXX, which is the 70, which has to do with the 72 translators that went from the land over to Greece or over to Egypt, sorry, where Ptolemy was, to do the translation for him, right? Again, the letter of Aristes is the account of, of all of that that happened. And that's here referred to as G, and the Samaritan Pentateuch here called S, differ in their presentations of pre- and post-flood genealogical chronologies. So you see that they're all messed up, right? M reports only 292 years from the flood to Noach, or uh, of Noach to Terach's 70th year. Mysteriously, S presents this period as 650 years longer than that, with an interval of 942 years. Yet G reports even 900 years longer than that reported by M. Is there any textual evidence that, and then there's also Josephus, which is another witness that we can compare and what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, like I was mentioning, right? It says, is there any textual evidence that the greater ages of G of Genesis 5 and 11 could be more original than the younger ages of M? While we do not yet possess direct evidence that answers unequivocally, the extent texts from the pre nazarene era, we can now engage this cat or with extent texts, so with the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? From the pre nazarene era, we can now engage this question. All right. Now it goes on in detail to do so, and this is like a 15 page document. So I highly encourage us, you know, you guys to read this on your own to go over that. And I don't believe that everyone has all the information accurate all the time. Even though I share these things, they might not be sharing things themselves or holding opinions that are accurate. It's quite often and tragically, for example, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, a new translation. It is the a compilation of the most complete version of the text that's been translated in one book. So I recommend it. It's easier to read for people and it's all put together instead of keeping all the, the, the different scrolls and all their different versions of fragments separated for each one to study independently like they do with the study edition or in the the discoveries of the Judean desert uh, text where they have all of the stuff for scholarly perusal, right? But in there, they also have commentary from these guys that's sometimes way off base. And while I don't condone or approve or agree with the opinions, the text isn't 
it, it speaks for itself. Although you also want to do different translations on that too, because the new translation does not include a part of the text that talks about um, being impelled on a, on a stake or a cross, for example. Um, and there's a few other things. I think it mentions the dove and something else that is in there that's di translated differently in a later version. So, um, yeah, just to recap here, because I don't want to go too far into this one, and I want to leave room for those videos. Everyone, I, 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 please, you want to check those out afterwards. But there's different versions of scripture that we have available, different sources that came down through different times in history. And while they themselves are not perfectly accurate, because there is no version that is completely 100% true anymore, they can be used to compare and see which ones support and have multiple witnesses to confirm what dates are accurate and which ones are not. And those different versions are what you can find from the text of the Bible and the apocryphal writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay. The common Bible version that we have in the Masoretic text. The Samaritan Pentateuch version. Right. And the Septuagint. And then on top of that, you also have the writings of Josephus, where he wrote the Antiquities of the Yahudim, which is pretty much from Genesis all the way to his times, but before the destruction of the land or the coming of Vespasian and Titus. And then you have another group of writings called the Wars of the Yahudim, which take place from the times of the Maccabees with the, the foreshadowing of um, what would happen later, all the way through to the destruction of the uh, the city there in 70 AD and then on to the destruction of the last battle in Masada where the rebels were taken out five years later. So he covers in detail the events that are missing from our common scriptures. But in there, he also has another witness to these genealogies or the chronology in them. And then as just one more witness to compare these with, in the, you have the list in the Yobelim, although it's not stated in the same way. They're given the year of the Yobel, sometimes very specific dates on when the men were born and then how long it was until their children were born, but it doesn't give the date they died. So you'll have to take that for what it is and just compare what you're able to. Now, the whole point in sharing all of this, Father willing, it can be plainly seen, is that we can't just make things up and have stuff fit the way we want it to. It would be nice to say, hey, this is what we have and this is the truth. You could just forget all that stuff, but it it isn't, it's disingenuous. It's not proving all things. And it's not actually sharing the reality or the truth of the situation. The idea that he was going to be maligned and, and made unrecognizable is a stated fact in scripture. The reality that we can see that it happened literally to the physical word is what we can see here that proves that his word is true because the truth is true in every context. Okay. But that doesn't mean that we can't, establish or know these things that he's given us to know we just have to do it the way he said to come to the truth as a child establish he is a witness of himself and the father witnesses in the works that he's able to do so we can take what's in the word as established truth just build multiple witnesses to prove it like he said to not not our own opinions not things that come to our mind but the actual the text right just like shawul says not to go beyond what is written so I thank you all for your time. You have a wonderful rest of your Shabbat and a week ahead. And uh, we'll wait for any questions and stuff later. So Shabbat Shalom.